Okay. Hello, welcome. My name is Linda Campani, and I'm the Spolio Family Director of the Breyer Center for Overseas Studies of Stanford University in Florence. It gives me great pleasure to be able to welcome you all to our second virtual event. Today, I have the distinct honor of introducing Justin Randolph Thompson, a media artist, an organizer, and an educator. He was born in the state of New York in a town along the Hudson River, but has been living between Italy and the US since more or less 2001. Thompson is an accomplished artist whose, works have been exhibited, whose work has been exhibited internationally in venues such as the Whitney Museum of American Art, the Reina Sofia in Madrid, and the American Academy in Rome, among others. He teaches art at several universities in Italy. Thompson is also the co-founder and director of Black History Month Florence, whose first edition dates back to 2016. And he is someone who has been actively working on a number of initiatives surrounding questions of Italianness and Blackness, cultural confusion and displacement. Over the summer, Italian newspapers reported about his work on what they called the Black Presence in the Uffizi Museum or Black Uffizi. And I invite you all to go on the Uffizi website to learn more about it. For the glorious Museo Madre in Naples, a contemporary art museum, he has just produced a short film in Super 8 whose title, Don't You Tell No One I Made It, cites Ezra Pound's cantos, and particularly Canto 81, Canti Pisani. It is narrated by a Florentine politician, Antonella Bundu, partly set in the Salone dei Cinquecento in Palazzo Vecchio, and it quotes both Ferdinando Martini, who in 1891 was the governor of Eritrea and was a minister of the colonies that Italy had at the time, as well as a, a marvelous speech that uh, the poet, cultural theoretician, and first president of Senegal, Leopold Sédar Sangor, gave in Palazzo Vecchio itself in 1962. Thompson, who is a man who practices what he preaches, has also been able to secure a physical space here in Florence through the local administration, which will become a center for cultural exchanges around questions of diversity, race, and inequality. As such, it will be very important for the whole city of Florence and our students alike, and it is the first center of that kind, certainly for Florence and Tuscany, but I suspect uh, for the greater, uh, for the most part of Italy as well. Uh, in keeping with this productive exchange, an interlocution to be sure, between Italianness and Blackness, the title of his talk tonight borrows from a Tuscan saying, prendere fischi per fiaschi, and he will tell us what it means. Now, as I thank you, Justin, for having accepted our invitation to be with us tonight, I would like to give our, our audience, our, our friends here uh, on, the, on the webinar, a couple of technical pieces of information. Well, first of all, Alessio will uh, take us through the uh, hour that we have together because we'll have uh, uh, moments in which are gonna, we're gonna see videos, uh, pieces of a video that Justin uh, had uh, done and shot uh, a couple of months ago, more or less. Uh, and Alessio says, if you notice a, a little bit of an out of sync moment between uh, uh, the voice and his uh, uh, lips, uh, uh, Justin's lips, of course, is uh, because of your uh, internet connection. It's not us, it's you. So this is, uh, uh, but in any case, we hope uh, it won't be, it won't be too, uh, uh, too, too strong, if at all. Uh, Fosca, Fosca da Cerno, our program coordinator, will, as she did in the course of our first event, uh, 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 pose the questions. There will be a time for Q&A after each video segment. And so Fosca will collect the questions that we ask you to please place in the Q&A uh, uh, icon uh, on, the, on the bottom right of the screen. 
whereas Giovanni, our, our academic and student services coordinator, will uh, work uh, and, and, and manage the chat. So with this, uh, thank you again, Justin, and here's to you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much uh, for the, the invitation and for this really, really wonderful introduction that uh, really summed up a lot of the complexities that make up my work and my reflection. Um, I wanted to um, say a few words about the title, uh, Fischi per Fiaschi, uh, but before that, maybe I should say that my, my name, my nickname as a child um, was Mr. Correct All. Um, and this was not a compliment. Um, it was based on a certain concern that I had for language and, and specificity, basically. And, um, you know, the thing is that often specificity of language um, helps us to be in touch with who we are um, and what it means to communicate with someone else. And so um, Fischi per Fiaschi comes out of a, an idea of confusion. Um, to mistake Fischi per Fiaschi is an Italian phrase that originates actually in theater, um, where, you know, Fischi refers to the sort of whistling of approval, and Fiaschi instead are dramatic failures. Uh, in fact, in the English language, we still use the word fiasco to talk about dramatic failures. Um, and um, this summer, uh, Black History Month Florence um, brought together um, a series of conversations that were designed to really think about positionality, uh, to think about how do we position ourselves before we engage with others. And it's really, um, I think there's two things that are really crucial to thinking about history um, and the exclusions that a lot of historical narrations encompass. And those things are specificity and positionality. Um, so both of these things are embedded in um, the series of videos we'll watch tonight and the ways in which they break down um, a number of different questions, right? There, um, in order to have specificity and positionality, we need a consciousness of our value systems, right? So first we're thinking about value and those are influenced by um, authority, who we choose to deem authorities, uh, the legitimacy that we grant them, the traditions that inform that legitimacy, and then the beliefs that then ultimately um, shape our beings. And so these are the things that we will dive through in four video segments. We will pause between each of the videos and uh, I'll be answering questions in those periods. So please enjoy. Thank you. So my name is Justin Randolph Thompson. Uh, I'm an artist, um, but I'm also a co-founder and director of Black History Month Florence, um, an initiative that was founded in 2016 to celebrate and think about uh, blackness within the context of Italy um, and to sort of really begin to deconstruct some of the historical narratives um, that are brought to us about the city of Florence and to open up the ways in which um, the realities of the history of Florence are much more dynamic and much more complex than we'd like them to be. Um, here I'm standing in front of the Bargello Museum, which is one of the icons of Florence, and I think it's a helpful way for us to think about some of the ways in which we can deconstruct um, and rethink some of the narrations of history and the things that we come to expect from this city. Uh, we're gonna be using a series of words to break these things down. Uh, we're looking at the words value, authority, legitimacy, and tradition. Um, these are really helpful terms for us to begin to unpack the significance of Florence and the ways in which we can access a more complex understanding of what this history can mean. The reason why the Bargello is a really interesting uh, building us, for us to think about and to look at in regards to this deconstruction of narratives is that when you walk into the Bargello, most people know it as the home to um, the representation of Renaissance sculpture in Florence. And indeed, that's what it represents right now, right? But then, you know, the, the building itself was actually the Palace of Justice. So the fact that this was a place where criminals were tried and actually executed um, changes the significance of things. And it also changes our expectations of a certain linearity and continuity, right? So that when we're in the space of the Bargello, we may think that this space is a museum. We may even understand the architecture in that way, when in actuality, it's not designed for that. And what it means to have these sculptures of the Renaissance within a space that actually was designed to sort of, uh, you know, serve judgment is actually a really interesting uh, thing, an interesting aspect for us to begin to dive into really what that history means and to understand the overlapping of histories and all of the narratives that are left out of what we're looking at.
So one of the words that we want to address in thinking about the city of Florence and its history and the ways in which we can access um, some of the untold stories and untold layers that this city holds is the word value. Um, and it's a good starting point. So to read the definition of value, value is the regard that something is held to deserve, the importance, worth, or usefulness of something. And another way of thinking about value, a second definition, is the principles or standards of behavior, one's judgment of what is important in life. So we get a sense already just from the definition about the, the ways in which the individual determines the meaning of this word. And I think in the city of Florence, in the way that the city presents itself and the histories that we expect to encounter in regards to the Renaissance, um, as you can see beyond us, we're here on Ponte Vespucci, which is three bridges down from Ponte Vecchio. So right up the river here, we're looking at Ponte Vecchio, then we're looking at Ponte Santa Trinita, then we have Ponte alla Caraia, all these bridges that sort of narrate um, the river for the city itself. And I think also that sort of conform to some of the romantic understandings that we may have of Florence, while also embedded, uh, being embedded with a layer of history. Um, one of the intriguing things about um, Ponte Vecchio um, and the bridges that lead over to here is of, of course the fact that Ponte Vecchio is called Ponte Vecchio because it's, it's the one bridge along this river that remains standing after the bombing in World War II. And so I think that bringing World War II into the perspective that we have of the way we understand the city of Florence is really crucial for us um, because it helps us to understand that Florence also is a modern city, right? It's gone through various phases. And so the fact that Ponte Santa Trinita uh, Ponte alla Caraia, and then lastly, Ponte Vespucci were constructed after the, they were destroyed. Um, Ponte Vespucci in particular um, is a bridge that was built in the 1950s, um, and it's one that's named after Amerigo Vespucci, that um, most people know as sort of um, an explorer, a voyager, um, who is from Florence. And actually, Amerigo Vespucci is who gives the name uh, to uh, the Americas, right? So his name is actually given um, through um, Gerardus Mercator, who is a, a map maker, and he made a very influential map in which he used uh, America to define the space. Um, one of the things that I like to think about in terms of um, the narrations of history and the ways in which we understand that is the ways in which before arriving in Florence, I actually was unaware of that as the reason why Florence, w I'm sorry, uh, America was named in the way that it was, right? And so we have this Florentine history that goes to define another space. Right. Um, and it also talks about the, the nature of international exchange. One of the things that I like to do in thinking about blackness in the space of Florence, black history in the context of Italy, is to think about the fact that actually there is no moment historically where um, the continent of Africa and the space of Italy are not connected. Right. Um, and going through these layers in a space like this, I think it's important also that there's layers of modern and contemporary history that trouble some of the ways in which we understand and interpret the, the space of Florence and some of the ways in which the values that seem to be laid out through the aesthetics and the ways in which things are narrated um, can, can sort of tell us about. And one of those is that this bridge was actually the site um, in uh, 2018. Uh, of the murder of Edi Dien, who was a Senegalese man who was based here in Florence for, for many years. Um, I've been in Florence for 20 years, and I like to think about um, you know, um, other people's experience in being in this city for that long. Um, in the case of, of this murder, it, there's a sort of irony of the space in its proximity to the U.S. consulate, um, and the idea that um, already this year, with the protests around George Floyd, um, we have this uh, protest that took place right here by the U.S. consulate, in which it was really difficult to not take note of the implications of racialized violence in this city as well, just in relation to this bridge. So in July of 2020, um, with the following the killing of George Floyd, the Black Lives Matter became a conversation that was happening also across Italy. Um, it's not that this conversation didn't exist before that moment, and there's many people that were bringing forward activism around reflections on racism in the context of Italy, systemic oppression, but I think that um, that moment sort of sparked something worldwide that reignited and reactivated a lot of people. And so there were protests actually gathered right a couple blocks from here, where I was asked also to speak in relation to um, you know, being here representing blackness in this context through Black History Month Florence, and then also um, being from the United States, so being this sort of bridge in a certain sense between cultures. And of course, for me, it was fundamental that in that moment, we think about the significance of these international relations and the implications of what we hear from abroad 
in inspiring us to think about the things that we witness and see here on the daily. And of course, being so close to Ponte Vespucci, it was difficult for me not to remember Edidien and to think about the anti-racism protests that took place in Florence in 2018 following his killing. Um, and then also Edie Dan connects us also to a longer legacy of racialized violence in Florence with two, 2011, the killing of two other Senegalese men. And so these are ways in which I think in our uh, contemporary understanding of Florence, we have to add these layers in uh, that connect to the sort of realities that we're living in this space um, that are coupled with all of the nostalgia, coupled with all of the true um, and powerful history that tends to dominate the narrative, but then also are undercut by these things. And I think that um, in the context of Florence, when we have Afro-descendant people, when we have Afro-diasporic people coming to this city, these are moments of history that, that really come up to the surface and become part of our reflection on what this, what this space represents. Um, and so I think, you know, here with the graffiti, we kind of have an emphasis on the ways in which this is really an urban city as well. And this graffiti down here, we can't see it from here, but there's actually a protest um, sign that actually says uh, George Floyd on it. So the presence of George Floyd's name in this city um, is something that isn't casual in relation to this bridge and to this site. Um, so I think in reimagining the values that are sort of inscribed in the way in which we write history, um, the, the undercutting of all the other layers of history, which tend not to be talked about when we think about Florence, um, are helpful to add to it the complexity that every city has. Very good. So now uh, Fosca will let us know uh, what questions uh, she received and, and we'll pose them to you, uh, Justin. Sure. Exactly. So we did receive um, where um, questions are coming in now through the Q&A and we do have some questions um, already to ask about this first segment of the video. So the first question is, I, I'm not sure that uh, many people do know much about the 2018 murder of um, Edie Danae. Could you just give us a little bit of background on that? Yeah, I mean, I think the, to give background on it, um, it's, it, um, it's an incident that basically um, the way in which it's described through media, a lot of times frames the way in which we understand it. Um, and, you know, the initial media response to that murder um, was was shocking. Um, it was it was a response that basically narrated um, the sort a lot of the life story of the murderer, um, the, his difficulties with work, his family relationship. Um, it talked about him at length and his depression, and it said that he um, wanted to take his life but couldn't bring himself to do it, and so he um, shot the first person he encountered. And um, in the media coverage, especially the first articles that came out, it said that he killed um, uh, an African, uh, I mean, the term that's used here is a lot of times that I got, so, so boy, um, you know, and um, it said that he killed uh, an African boy and that um, there was no um, racial implications of this. I mean, that was stated in the first article that came out. The fact that there was no racial implication of it is something that actually followed in all the successive media coverages as well, and to this day sort of stands in. Um, but then when we really look at um, the ways in which um, th this figure, um, who was not a, a boy at all, you know, uh, was a grown man, um, is, is narrated and flattened in that. Um, I think that also in those first articles, it talked about him being um, an illegal uh, salesperson, right? So these are the ways in which we frame on one side um, the murderer, um, and we humanize him to the extreme, uh, even his, his trauma. And then on the other side, the figure is flattened to an, an African person um, who was illegally here, right? Um, you know, and, and these, are, these are the narrations that sort of make, make it, um, uh, it, it, it's really shocking that this is the kind of narration that happens in this space. And I think that, you know, the, the, the actual um, event, which then, of course, you know, the uh, cameras were looked at to sort of look at and examine exactly what happened. And it turns out, um, which is no surprise, that he was not the first person that was encountered, um, which, you know, sh should not be surprising. But I think that mainly the thing that was uh, a little disturbing to me was the fact that um, in that moment of, um, you know, uh, deep depression on the behalf of the Senegalese community, um, which, um, you know, had also responded to, to murders in their community uh, just years before. Um, the, the request to the city to really respond with a moment of mourning was not, was not met immediately. And um, I think that that led to, um, you know, f further 
uh, unrest, um, you know, which was really natural. And to give it one other layer, um, there, there was the um, overturning of two flower planters that made the headlines um, for, for, again, thinking about media, the headlines talked about the fact that these uh, planters were turned over. Um, and they really you know, stated, this is not, a, not gonna be permitted in our city. And so the ways in which the, the city responds to these flower pots with such um, disgust, um, but does not respond to this murder um, it is one of the pop problematic frameworks that helps us to understand the ways in which the underlying values that are set up across society. Um, you know, we, we use terms like, uh, you know, unconscious bias, right? But these are terms that in this space are not really reflected upon very often, right? And so we have to sort of think about that as well and the ways in which, um, you know, these are, these are these layers that are actually embedded in value systems and we can read them very clearly in a media coverage or in the response of the city itself. Thank you, that was a really exhaustive reply. We have another question that just came in, which is related to, to this, but <clears throat> more to, to what we're living through right now. And the question is specifically, how has the pandemic affected movements like Black Lives Matter? And what is it like to be an activist and an artist right now? Yeah, no, thank you for that question. Um, I, you know, the, the pandemic, I think, affected everything, right? All facets of life. Um, I think that you know the vulnerabilities that were existing in society are, are rendered that much more evident, and so um, it's. I don't think it's casual that in the very moment that we have, um, you know, uh, the the arrival of this pandemic and lockdowns, but we also have the sort of um, you know emergence of a need to respond on behalf of all the people that are most vulnerable. So um, braccianti, which are agricultural workers. Um, they unionize in this moment, right? So they come forth with uh, a spokesperson that is sort of a, a leader for them and they, they unionize in this moment, right? And so there's more presence for them. And I don't think that that's casual because it's clear that th these are the people that are still going to work in order for us to eat the food that we eat. And there's still um, those that are, that are um, you know, basically in forms of modern slavery, right? And so as an artist and as an activist, um, you know, I like to think about Paul Robeson's um, call to arms, which says that the artist cannot remain aloof. Um, we have to respond to the challenges that are brought forth by society. And um, this is a call that I feel uh, deeply as an artist and as an activist. And so, you know, this moment has been one that actually slows down and distills certain moments of time and actually asks us to engage more profoundly, right? And so I think this is something that I really uh, have taken to heart and I've seen that a lot of the people in my network have done the same. Um, at the same time, it's, it's, a, it's a moment of extreme exhaustion, right? Um, from the sort of constant uh, battle that is present, you know, and the ways in which these are not issues that are new to us now. Um, these are things that we've been dealing with all along, but that get exasperated in various moments. Thank you so much. I think we can move on to the next video clip now. And I'll just remind people to keep putting their questions in the Q&A. Thanks so much, Justin. So we're here at the Galleria degli Uffizi, which are sprawled out here behind me. Um, and to address another word that is helpful in framing the way in which we understand and think about the city of Florence and its history, um, we're going to use the word authority. And authority is the power or right to give orders, make decisions, and enforce obedience. And in thinking about the Galleria degli Uffizi, um, we're talking about a history that goes back to the 1500s um, when Cosimo de Medici constructs this, right? Um, but the way in which that history informs the way that we understand it right now um, is a little bit more layered. So when we walk into the Uffizi, when we hear about the Uffizi, when we see the works of the Uffizi, what we actually see is a representation of Renaissance history um, as told through painting. And in a certain sense, this is a space that goes to define uh, Italian Renaissance art. Um, and so really when we think about sort of the gatekeepers to culture, the gatekeepers to all of the image that we have of Italian Renaissance art, this is the space that actually um, is in charge of that. So um, I think that, you know, in the work that I do with uh, Black History Month Florence, we decided um, that in thinking about the context of Florence, one of the things that we could not um, 
avoid was to think about Renaissance history. Um, and a lot of times, you know, as I was saying before, a black history in the space of Italy is something that extends back as far as the Italian territory has existed. Um, so we can talk about Roman antiquity and talk about blackness. There's no moment in history where this is not relevant. And so, of course, like in thinking about the Renaissance, um, one of the things that um, I think was important for us to think about was the ways in which we have actually the representations of black Africans in paintings that were painted in the Renaissance that have been a part of this collection since its beginning. And the the ways in which those stories are, uh, tend not to be narrated, um, the ways in which those stories are excluded from some of the tour guides that are given. And actually, a lot of times, the tour guides themselves don't have the information to really provide us with an understanding of who these figures are, why they're present in the paintings, what the significance of these commissions were, and then also the, the, the value and meaning uh, of the pieces. And so what we, what we see is, of course, this museum is, of course, sort of an authority on Renaissance art history. And so when we exclude these kinds of narrations from the conversation, in a certain sense, the authority is deeming them sort of not a part of what this space represents. So fortunately, the director of the Uffizi, Eike Schmidt, was interested in sort of uh, troubling those kinds of narratives and introducing things that are actually in plain sight. The project that we curated is called On Being Present, and it's one that was really just about thinking about um, the space of the Uffizi and the, what kinds of histories are actually present here in plain sight uh, that are are simply present, right? So this sort of presence, um, but at the same time can tell us something about the, the history of art and the history of this city that are not often included. The range of works that we uh, put together um, in the virtual exhibition um, is about 10 images. Um, within the holdings of the Uffizi, there's uh, roughly 30 images that come to mind without further research. Um, and so the, the black presence in this um, uh, museum is really extensive. We decided to bring together a group of um, eight um, researchers to really dive in and start to narrate those histories and to think about what it means also to engage in scholarship around a subject matter that is really undocumented or underdocumented and underrepresented. So within the context of uh, the Uffizi Gallery and within the context of our project on being present, um, there's been many layers that we've put into this work and we've reached out to a range of scholars in different fields who have been working with the history of blackness in Renaissance Europe and also some scholars who've been working with the history of specific Renaissance artists who may have not thought about the context of blackness within the figures in their paintings. Um, behind me we have uh, Michelangelo, but then we can think about all of the other artists that you would typically think about represented within here. And one of the interesting things is that on being present is not about looking for obscure artists. So within the um, range of works that we're looking at, we're actually looking at artists like Bronzino, artists who are completely central to the narration of Italian Renaissance history. Um, it's just that they're maybe not looked at through this lens. And one of the things that we wanted to do was to think about the ways in which scholarship um, at times um, will avoid those sort of absences. So in a certain sense, the ways in which blackness has been brought down to us through those paintings um, has, is through the image itself and the representation of this person. Outside of that, the information that we have about these figures is actually very minimal. And so what it means to sort of be able to construct a name, a geographic origin, in an age, and the ways in which that trans transforms entirely the way in which we think about the, the Medici court and the people that were present here, the power of representation, whether we're talking about the portraiture that was done of um, African rulers that were included amongst important people, or we're talking about the servants of the, the Medici court and the ways in which they represent a presence um, for us that actually begins to narrate a different way of thinking about this history. Um, the, just the simple stating of history around these um, objects without necessarily a critical glance, but really thinking about what it means for this museum to, to have these objects and to not narrate them, um, is something that actually caused a lot of uh, up unrest, right? And so there was actually a backlash towards the project itself. And what's interesting is that the backlash, their, uh, the saying that accompanied them was with, with uh, big banners that were right here where we are that said, keep your hands off of our patrimony. And so it, it brings us to think about what what was attempt what they were attempting to protect um, because you know what I what I told the director of the Uffizi is that um, th they weren't attacking the Uffizi galleries right they were attacking the reflection that I was bringing into it that actually is already present in the museum and so how fragile the construction of this sort of um, you know canon is and in a seclusion of these figures so we, we still have um, 
some good questions coming in in the Q&A, but I want to be mindful of, of time. So I'm just going to ask you one now, and then maybe we can table the others for, you know, either the end of all the videos or at the end of the next video. So um, we have a question. Um, someone wants to know a little bit more about the On um, Being Present project at the Uffizi and more specifically about the, the backlash that you mentioned. Um, so was the reaction all negative or, or did, did, I mean, I, I, I know the answer, but I mean, was it all negative or I mean, was there something hopefully very good that came out of this really exciting project? Yeah, thank, thanks for that question. Um, no, I mean, the, the, um, the response was overwhelmingly positive. Um, you know, there was something that was covered internationally. Um, the, the reflections that were born from it are, are immense. And I think that, you know, institutionally, from the standpoint of the Uffizi, um, it, it's been one of the projects that was actually greatest received. So it's on a platform that's called Hypervisions. And of the Hypervisions um, virtual exhibit, exhibits, this one was the most visited. Um, they did a social media campaign connected to it. It was the most frequented social media campaign that they had. So, I mean, it's clear that the response was very positive. Um, the backlash was actually by just a few few people, right, uh, representing some of the far right wing uh, political parties here, Kazajit. Um, and it's, it's actually really no surprise, but I think it is telling um, when you hear slogans like, you know, keep your hands off our patrimony and the sort of the, the questioning uh, of something a lot, uh, it, it sort of surrounded this idea that maybe we had brought blackness into the Uffizi. And I think that this is um, something that, that of course, um, uh, again, it, what we did was not exactly even a provocation. It was really just an acknowledgement, right? Of something that's there. And, and it's just telling the ways in which, um, you know, to, to simply acknowledge a presence. Um, I think that people uh, get so caught up in the idea that um, a, another more complete narration cancels the original narration. And, um, you know, th th that's just like really far from the truth, right? And so we, we have multiple narrations of history that are happening all the time. And, um, you know, the more we get, the more complete our understanding of history actually is. Yeah. Perfect. I think we can move on um, to the next segment. So we're here in Piazza della Signoria with Palazzo Vecchio right here and a number of sculptures that I think are familiar to anybody who looks into Florence and is interested in coming here. Um, these are the images that we're sort of um, bombarded with uh, in regards to the history of this city and as representations of what this city stands for. Uh, I wanted to start with a word here to think about, again, framing Florence and rethinking Florence, and the word is legitimacy. And legitimacy translates to the conformity to the law or to rules or the ability to be defended with logic or justification, something's validity. And I think it's an important um, word in thinking about the ways in which we construct ideas of authority, the ways in which we construct ideas of representation in a city, and the ways in which we legitimize those constructions as well. So um, these images do indeed represent Florence, and they do indeed represent this space, Palazzo Vecchio, to, started as um, you know a Medici household, but then it actually through the years becomes the seat of city government, and that's true today. So we have um, this con continuation of this building representing the ways in which the city is being governed. And so as we think about the layers of that, we have to also think about the realities that, that this square brings to it with it, right? So we have um, beyond all of these sort of incredible sculptures and everything, this was a site of also public execution, you know? And that's something that I think helps to contextualize the moment of, of the Renaissance and all of the social realities that were accompanying it. And I think that besides that, um, you know, there's an interesting way in which the sculptures themselves, a lot of us like to appreciate the beauty of these sculptures in terms of their formal qualities. And I think that that's really important for us to do. But we have to take a moment also to think critically about what these sculptures represent. Also because as public monuments, they're not casual or subtle in what they're speaking to us about, right? And so um, the famous David is about the conquering of a giant. And we can think about that in political terms as well. And so the reason why you would put a public sculpture of that actually is really um, clear. Um, in the same way that Cosimo de' Medici on horseback 
um, with military armor is a really clear signal in terms of what it stands for. And so, you know, we have to be able to appreciate, again, the value artistic and formal value of these works while also deconstructing some of what's been written about them from a social standpoint and understand that the social realities of this period are, are more complex than that. Um, Palazzo Vecchio being the sort of uh, current city government, it's also something that um, in the research that we do for Black History Month Florence, we have an ongoing project that is called Black Archive Alliance. It's a project that goes into private and public collections, archives, and libraries and looks for connections to Africa that have existed throughout the centuries. Um, when we initiated that project in 2018, we thought that it might be hard to find the things that we were after um, in each of these spaces, but instead what we found is that all of these things were completely on the surface. They were all there. They were just not being researched and developed. One of the things that we uh, decided to look into and to elaborate upon was a historic um, uh, mayor of Florence, which is Giorgio Lapira. Um, he's considered the mayor saint. Um, he did um, some really incredible things in regards to peace for this city. And one of the things that he initiated in the 60s um, was called the, the Dialoghi Mediterranei, the Dialogues about the Mediterranean. And there were actually um, intercultural dialogues um, about the current state of various spaces and what they signified politically and what they signified also socially. And one of the, the extended um, invitations um, was towards the figure of Leopold Senghor, who was the then uh, president of Senegal, which was a newly liberated Sen Senegal that had just rid itself of French colonialism. And we have to think about the significance of this invitation here of this figure to Florence to talk about the state of Africa and what Africa actually meant in that moment. So what this continent could bring for um, you know, this place, and then what Senegal as a state could actually really represent as well. And this is an ongoing friendship that happened between Senghor and La Pira that actually brought about some really magical conversations. So in, from the steps of Palazzo Vecchio, which is behind me, uh, this is where Leopold Senghor in 1962 delivered a speech. And I'm gonna read just a little portion of this speech to you. Um, he started by asking a question that is actually a form of greeting in Senegal. And the question is, people of Florence, do you have peace? And I, I like the fact that he starts with this question, asking about the state of things here before he dives in. And he continues saying, from the sparkling stones suddenly rendered to life, a clamor has arisen. Humanity can never be threatened any more than it has been in recent years, because the ideas of peace and fraternity have never been ridiculed as much as they have been in these last years. Uh, and this is in October of 1962. And I like to think about the resonance of these words um, in this context, and also to think about what it means to have this, um, this African leader um, speak this to the Florentine population of the 1960s, um, you know, and to think about what the moment of the 60s meant for Florence as well, for the people that were living here, um, and the ways in which this sort of enriches some of the ways in which we think about history. And as a connection to our contemporary times, one interesting fact is that the Mediterranean dialogues that Giorgio Lapira initiated in the 60s um, were actually the place where um, uh, the parents of Antonella Bundu, who um, was the first black mayoral candidate um, to ever run, run in Florence, um, her parents met in those dialogues. And so it was this coming together of students. Her father was uh, a student from Sierra Leone. Her, her mother was a student from Florence. And they came together, met there, and she's the offspring. And a lot of her activism is rooted in some of these reflections that were planted way back in the 60s. Thanks so much, Justin, for, um, for this really interesting um, dive into uh, the history of uh, this history that we really don't know. So we have a question um, specifically about the work that you are doing with the Black Archive Alliance Project, sort of what, what are the current focuses of your research? And I'm going to just just ask this one question and maybe we can at the end of the everything um, answer any other questions that are outstanding but I'm going to have to ask you to just be succinct so we can be sure to get through the last video and have time at the end for any additional Q&A. Thanks so much. Yeah um, well I mean uh, Black Archive Alliance is now in its third uh, volume and um, for the third volume we, we always take on sort of hybrid and experimental approaches. Um, this time what we've done is we have a group of five um, Afro-descendant artists that we had invited in for a residency and we decided to connect researchers with, with them. 
to sort of think about ways in which we can create collectivity and generate research in a different platform. And so the third volume is dedicated to five Afro-descendant researchers in dialogue with five artists, really thinking about the archive as something that is material and immaterial. So also thinking about all those things that are documented through lived experience, um, the focus is everything from uh, spirituality and the retention of uh, African spirituality in diaspora in the context of Italy, um, the um, uh, existence of documentation of um, colonial history through something like the La Difesa de la Razza, which was a magazine, um, and um, you know uh, the, the history of a school that is an Italian art school in Cameroon and the ways in which this fosters then a connection to Italy and bringing um, artists over. To, from Cameroon um, and uh, coffee as a material and the traces of sort of colonial history and the significance of the ways in which um, our lived experience in Italy and the idea of coffee as being this very Italian thing uh, become really relevant. And then anti-racism um, in the context of, um, of Italy through the figure of Jerry Maslow. Um, and, you know, really think about this figure who was murdered in 1989 and the ways in which that is sort of something that sort of plants a seed um, for a, a more modern and contemporary reflection on anti-racist um, activism in this space. Wonderful. Okay, so let's move on to the last clip and then we'll um, save any questions for the end of the session. Thanks so much. So here we want to dive into another word that is significant for us to think about this space of Florence, to think about its history, and that's the word tradition. Tradition is one of the words that we really need to dive into and really need to think and really need to unpack because I think a lot of times we take for granted its significance. So the way in which tradition is defined is the transmission of customs or beliefs from generation to generation or the fact of being passed on in this way. And this is typically the way in which tradition is understood um, by most of us as something that is simply passed on. Uh, but I like to think about the ways in which tradition is actually much more complicated than that. There's, there's nothing really passive about tradition. And so um, I like to look to someone like T.S. Eliot. Um, so T.S. Eliot in his essay, um, Tradition versus the Individual Talent, um, brings to us this quote, um, yet if the only form of tradition of handing down consisted in following the ways of the immediate generation before us in a blind or timid adherence to its successes, tradition should positively be discouraged. We have seen many such simple currents soon lost in the sand, and novelty is better than repetition. Tradition is a matter of much wider significance. It cannot be inherited, and if you want it, you must attain it by great labor. The historical sense involves a perception, not only of the pastness of the past, but of its presence. I think this is a really important quote for us to think about in regards to the ways in which we understand um, traditions and traditional forms as something that we need to renegotiate every time we encounter them. Um, there's a, a griot um, who is um, originally from Senegal named Dudu Coate, who's based in Northern Italy, Bergamo. Um, and he talks about the ways in which the oral tradition tends to be undervalued, but actually the oral tradition is a way to take history and constantly update it with our feelings, our current perceptions, and also a response to who we're sharing the information with. Um, so all those things influence the way in which we understand tradition and our own role within it. Here we're standing in front of a, a marker uh, on the street. It's a, it's a tradition in Florence and in many cities to put a marble placard that celebrates histories, right, uh, of important events or historic figures. In this case, this is celebrating the figure Alessandro Senegalia, which in regards to black history in the context of Florence, this is a really important figure for me personally, uh, because he, he was born in 1902 and he was uh, a black Italian resistance fighter, so a partigiano. Um, this is a figure that was born in Fiesole to an African-American mother who was actually um, working in a household um, in Fiesole um, and to a Jewish father who was coming uh, down from Mantova. And so we have actually in this figure of Alessandro Senegalia all these layers of prejudice that this city um, in the time of its uh, Nazi fascist occupation um, was sort of representing, right? So all these prejudices against uh, Jewish, against blackness with the racial laws. Um, and then, of course, um, his, his um, left-leaning, um, you know, his communism, everything that he represented in regards to um, resisting and fighting against fascism, these are also embedded in his figure. Um, this plaque commemorates the fact that he was murdered here 
in Via Pandolfini, somewhere near this spot, in 1944, uh, so just before the end of the war. Um, he was involved in all these covert, covert operations to, to overcome the occupation. Um, it was an in incredibly important figure. And one of the things that I like to think about is the ways in which we decide to use these placards to commemorate death or important events. And in this case, this is just commemorating his death. And so what it means to, for us to celebrate the death of a figure rather than the life, right? So this is not a placard to the life of Alessandro Senegalia, right? It's something that simply talks about the fact that he was brutally murdered here, trucidato. Um, and I think that as we think about the tradition of commemoration, what we choose to commemorate is also an important thing. It's almost as important as who we choose to commemorate. And also the fact that this is undersigned by the Resistenza of Fiorentina, this is a group that through today represents um, anti-fascist um, reflections and uh, the celebration of partisans, um, partigiani, resistance fighters in the city of Florence. And so this is an important marker for all of those reasons. And I like to think of the fact that right here next to it is this sort of storefront, right, that used to sell um, milk and, and other goods and the ways in which this is actually something that probably was here when Alessandro Senegalia was murdered. And so we have this physical presence of something that was an, a business. At the same time, next to it, we have sort of a commemoration of this violence that happened right out in front of this business. Um, so as we sort of think about the layers and what we're actually commemorating, what we carry on, these are important things to keep in mind. There's a group called Ampi, that does um, work around celebrating uh, Partigiani and resistance history in Florence, um, who comes out here and every year commemorates the death of Alessandro Senegalia by bringing together a group of people to sing the songs that were created around him. Uh, this is a figure who they named a whole brigata, a whole brigade after. Um, and there's a number of songs that were written in his honor. And so he brings uh, this group of people here. And one of the things that Black History Month Lawrence has been doing is trying to work to bring younger generations out here to think about the significance of this history. So as we start to talk about black lives and the movement that's happening around them, I think it's important to think about the ways in which this figure actually can be one of the local heroes that we might be able to celebrate. And there's been a lot of movement to sort of push towards the naming of a street or a location that uh, we've been involved in as well after this figure as a way of commemorating him a bit more. And I like to think about the ways in which naming of streets, uh, a lot of times we take the names of streets for granted. So they're not actually all the time commemorations, right? This is Via Pandolfini, which is named after a very important family that had a bishop. Right? Um, and so the ways in which that history might also be lost to us. Right? And so we have to kind of keep history alive by walking into it and really um, uncovering it each time. So as a conclusion to this sort of unusual or um, you know, a more profound reflection on the history of Florence through a tour, um, I want to close with one word um, that I didn't list before, and that's the word beliefs, um, because I think that this is so core to thinking about what we carry with us and the ways in which it sort of protects us. Sometimes it puts us in a bubble, right? Um, and beliefs are defined as an acceptance that something exists or is true, especially without proof, or a trust, faith, or confidence in some, someone or something. Uh, and I think one of the things that I like to do in thinking about beliefs is to go to uh, a poet, African-American poet named Saul Williams, who wrote a, uh, a poem that talks about beliefs in which he says that beliefs are the police of the mind. And he talks about the ways in which um, beliefs actually really control our minds most of the time. And a lot of times they go unquestioned. So how a belief got into our mind and became to define us, a lot of times is more abstract and we don't really think about it. And so he asked this really important question. He asked, what is your mind's immigration policy? So what is it that decides what gets in or doesn't get in? And how are we questioning everything that is policing our own borders as a way of then being open to engaging in a more profound reflection on history, tradition, and the meaning of everything that surrounds us. And I think that's something that's particularly important in coming abroad to Florence and thinking about this site is that we carry with us all of these beliefs, all of these understandings of what this history means, and we need to be open to questioning those beliefs in order to begin really experiencing what Florence signifies. So we have um, just gotten two really good questions. One is personal and more, uh, and the other is, is more specifically related to your, to your work. And I think they're a good way for us to, um, to close this really um, incredibly informative session 
that you've given us. So the first, as I said, is a personal question for you. I hope you don't mind. Um, can you tell us a little about how you came to live and work in Florence and what the arc of your career has been? Yeah, yeah, no, thank you for that question. Um, I originally came to Florence as a, as a student. Um, I, I was studying art in, uh, in Tennessee, Knoxville, Tennessee. And um, I knew that I wanted to learn some of the techniques that I felt I was not learning at my home school. And um, honestly, it was a bit of a whim that I thought that in Florence, I could learn that. Um, so I had taken a, a, a Renaissance art history course, which talked a lot about Florence, um, which I did not love the course, but something about it maybe placed that place in my mind. And so I originally came over here as a student then, and I studied uh, painting, I studied jewelry making, um, and sort of fell in love with the place and mainly fell in love with the ways in which it opened my own perception of, of, of self, of history and of culture. Um, and, and so the arc of my career, um, you know, I think that I've, I've always been involved in, in, in these kinds of conversations. Um, I'm always someone that's asking for a critical engagement and social reflection. Um, but I think that, you know, the first 10 years of my career in Italy uh, were, were really spent in my studio a lot or with my family. Um, and less out in the streets, um, engaging in the realities that were outside the door. And um, about 10 years into exhibiting work and understanding that you know, the exhibitions of work was really not enough to create the kind of social movement um, that I wanted to, to happen. And my, my maybe uh, lack of enthusiasm about some of the art um, world that was outside the door, I felt that it was really sort of perhaps my duty to uh, try to work towards making it the place I wanted it to be. Um, and so, you know, the, the last 10 years of my life have really been dedicated to thinking about that and what can I do to sort of facilitate the work for artists that a lot of times just leave the country because the opportunities are set up the way they are or because um, the economic standing of artists in the country and the value which culture, contemporary culture holds is so minimal. Um, and so that's really the, the second half of my, uh, you know, career, let's say, has really been dedicated to that and Black History Month Florence is a representation of that. And you've given me a perfect segue, <clears throat> excuse me, into the final question, um, which is, so somebody wants to know your thoughts about the intersection adherence to formal aesthetic critique and upholding socially constructed traditional aesthetic values. And within that same question, this person would like to know also what language you would use or you will use um, when you're going to talk about this problem with students, with um, Stanford students. Um, yeah, no, thank you for that question. That's a, that's a complicated one, right? Um, so, I mean, I think that, you know, ultimately we are, we are really taught a lot of times um, that um, the things that we're learning in art history, the things that we're learning in our art courses in terms of art practice um, are the things to learn. Um, we're not really taught to question them. We're not really taught to look at who wrote the history books that we're reading. Right. And instead, I think, you know, for me, um, education is really about uh, making sure that student, the students that we have are making questions like, you know, the, the best thing that can happen is to produce students that are curious enough to ask many questions to challenge. And in order to do that, I think that the overlapping of aesthetics and, and meaning, that's really what art is. Right. The art for me is, is all about the recalibration right, of value. It's all about that, whether we're talking about cultural value, social value, economic value, this is what we're talking about. And in order to sort of think about the, you know, this, this balance and the way in which we can sort of move it, we can't leave aesthetics out, right? And, but we have to understand that aesthetics as they have been stated historically, as they have been taught to us are, is not the aesthetic, right? We, we have all the room in the world to sort of construct what we want out of that. And we have to question the continuation of something that simply is being repeated for this understanding of tradition that is um, just a little bit short-sighted, right? And we have to think about how we insert ourselves into every medium that we use, every mark that we make, every aesthetic that we choose to engage in, and the social realities that connect to those things, whether we want them there or not. Thank you very much, Justin, for this uh, walkthrough a type of a set of things and a, and, a, and a face of Florence, which is not um, very well known and we hope will become better known as time goes by and as your work proceeds. 
I want to thank, um, uh, of course, Fosca, who's always gracious and wonderful in her, uh, uh, you know, facilitating the Q&A and contributes a, a great deal to our events. And so does Alessio and, uh, uh, and so does Giovanni, whose face we do not see. Um, you may not know, Justin, but uh, the uh, uh, bridge and the area where you decided to begin your video bears huge relevance to Stanford University as a whole, because just behind your shoulders on the wall that faces the river of the Grand Hotel, now St. Regis Hotel, is another of those plaques. Uh, this time, it's a plaque that the graduating class of 1907 from Stanford University put in the memory of Lee on Stanford Jr., who had passed away in the Grand Hotel when uh, in Europe on the second grand tour with his parents. And out of this uh, tragedy, uh, the couple uh, uh, made, uh, uh, you know, came an act of extraordinary generosity and they decided that they would uh, found a university in a farm that they owned south of San Francisco and that they would educate the children of California because their own and only son uh, could not get his education having uh, died only a few months uh, before before going to to college. So so uh, I, I, I like to end with this uh, Stanford thought because um, I want to say that the work you're doing, Justin, um, is relevant for your art, is relevant for the uh, narratives and the discourses that you're uh, that you've been working on. For, for, for 20 years in Italy now, but it's going to be extraordinarily important for Stanford students as well, and all the American students who come uh, to spend time in Florence and more often than not are faced with, uh, with, uh, with, with, with sometimes episodes of racism, but more generally they're faced with a, a lot of difficulties in trying to come to terms with a different history, a city, that seems to have no space at all for them in its history and its traditions in its monuments and so on and so forth. So by uncovering these other truths as you have been doing, you're doing a great service to our students as well uh, because they'll find a place for them in Florence. So they, they'll, they'll, they'll see. Uh, and so this is quite, quite extraordinary and we're lucky. Uh, Stanford and Florence is very lucky that uh, we've been able to uh, to meet you and to become friends uh, with you. And so we will follow your work and uh, we'll, um, you know, we'll, uh, we'll continue this, uh, this friendship in, in ways that, uh, that are going to be extraordinarily beneficial for our students and we hope vice versa because uh, they can also contribute their narratives, their stories, their ways in which they look at the city to the work that you and your colleagues uh, do. So thank you very much. Yeah, no, thank you. I'm really, really grateful for the opportunity to share this with uh, all of your students and your community. Again, thank you all. Uh, and thank you again, Fosca, Lacey, and Giovanni. Grazie a tutti. E buone feste. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Arrivederci. Arrivederci.